right, good morning, everyone. Thanks again for being here with us this morning. I'm Joshua Cohen. I'm the Community Director at Partners for Climate Action, Hudson Valley, where we deploy capital in its many forms to support local equitable solutions across the Hudson Valley to support ecological leadership. So this is our morning coffee session entitled Preserving Native New York Pollinators, What to Know and What to Do. These sessions are part of a series intended to, uh, as learning opportunities for our local climate community. So before I introduce my colleague Avalon, who will be facilitating today's session, I want to let you know that we will have a Q&A session after Matt's presentation. So feel free to put questions in the chat throughout if you'd like, and we will try to answer those during that section specifically. I'd like to ask when you're not speaking to try to keep yourself on mute just to cut down on background sound as well. And I will hand it over to you, Avalon. Thank you, Joshua. Um, good morning, everybody. This is so exciting. So we have a wonderful session for you today, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Matt. Um, before I do that, I just want to provide a little bit of context about this program. So as Joshua mentioned, this is part of our morning coffee series. This um, presentation is also going to overlap with Partners for Climate Action's Pollinate Now program, which is a habitat restoration initiative that is designed to support many of the at-risk native pollinators that you're going to be learning about very shortly. So I just wanted to quickly plug that initiative. So this year, we have four pilot sites or anchor sites going in in Gallatin, Red Hook, Gardner, and Kingston, and those sites are going to be installing native pollinator-friendly landscapes um, designed by Landscape Interactions, a wonderful firm out of Western Massachusetts. And Landscape Interactions has also created extensive plant lists that show which pollinators are associated with each of the native plants recommended for this bioregion. So those landscape designs, those samples, and also those plant lists with pollinator associations um, are going to be available uh, hopefully this spring, and those are going to be suitable for replication by landowners and gardeners at any scale. So we would love for you to sign up. I think Joshua is going to be dropping a link into the chat where if you're interested in learning more about that program, you can sign up to receive those plant lists and those designs. Um, you can also choose to get information about educational opportunities. We're going to have some really exciting field trips and we'll have volunteer opportunities at those um, pilot sites as we go through um, site prep and planting this year. So we would love to see you there. Um, and that is kind of how we came to our speaker today because the Empire State Native Pollinator Survey, which you'll be hearing about, formed a big part of figuring out what pollinators are at risk in our area and what we should be supporting with this Pollinate Now program. So it's now my absolute pleasure to introduce Matt Schlesinger. Um, Matt is zooming in from Albany today, and Matt is Chief Zoologist at the New York Natural Heritage Program, um, which I think he'll talk a little bit about. So Matt co-coordinated the Empire State Native Pollinator Survey, and he has also overseen many other wildlife conservation and inventory projects that range from beetles to birds to baleen whales. Um, he helped to, to describe a new species of leopard frog along the Atlantic coast. He led statewide surveys for rare tiger beetles. In addition to the Empire State Native Pollinator Survey, he co-authored the New York Dragonfly and Damselfly Survey, so that's out there. And Matt also helped to design a whale monitoring effort for the New York Bite. He also is co-chair of the steering committee for the third New York Breeding Bird Atlas, if we have any birders out there. And in his spare time, he is adjunct assistant professor in the Environmental Forest Biology Department at SUNY ESF. <clears throat> um, Matt received his PhD in ecology from the University of California at Davis, his master's in natural resources and the environment from the University of Michigan, and his BA from Wesleyan University. Um, and we are incredibly excited that he is joining us today to talk about the Empire State Native Pollinator Survey. So as Joshua mentioned, um, Matt's going to be talking for about 20 to 30 minutes, and we're going to have ample time for questions. I have a few questions I'm dying to ask him, so we might do a little moderated Q&A, and then I will go through the chat and hopefully get to everybody. I might consolidate similar questions, but um, definitely pop your questions in the chat as we go. And with that, I'm thrilled to turn it over to Matt. Thank you, Avalon, and, and thank you, Joshua, <clears throat> and thanks to Partners for Climate Action for for having me um, today to speak about the Empire State Native Pollinator Survey. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And, um, and I think I'll dive right in if that's okay. I'll share my screen and I wanna talk to you about, mainly about this uh, five-year 
plus effort we um, we undertook to understand the distribution and status of native pollinators of New York State. Um, it was a, um, a long time coming this project and I'll talk a little bit about the background of it. Uh, I also want to acknowledge some co-authors on, on the, the report that we put out and um, and all along I was co-coordinating with uh, Aaron White, who's a zoologist and project coordinator at the Natural Heritage Program, and Tim Howard, our director of science, who is chiefly responsible for a lot of the, the maps and, and, um, and data products we had coming out of the study. So as uh, the Pollinate Now partnership came up with a, a data request, a simple data request, uh, but it seemed like exactly how we wanted the data and the project to be used, to be put to use to, to um, uh, restore uh, pollinator habitat, especially focused on at-risk species, and and so it seemed like a natural a natural fit. So anyway, very glad to be here. Uh, this project um, was a partnership uh, between. I'll have a slide with a million names on it toward the end. But uh, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation funded the work um, through uh, an allocation from the state's Environmental Protection Fund. So when you see in the state budget that the Environmental Protection Fund got a boost, yay! That's good because it it helps. Um, pollinators among other species. Um, my program is um, with the uh, SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, but we're based in Albany. And I'll give you a little more detail about that next. So the New York Natural Heritage Program is part of a network of natural heritage programs that were created uh, by the Nature Conservancy starting in the 1970s as a way for, um, for states and conservation organizations to track um, species and habitats of conservation importance. They were farmed out from the Nature Conservancy to various state agencies and universities, and they're overseen um, by NatureServe, which is a global organization uh, run out of Arlington, Virginia, uh, that, that coordinates the work of the Natural Heritage Network and rolls up the data for uh, national and global purposes. So as I mentioned, we're at, uh, SUNY, affiliated with SUNY ESF, uh, but we work very closely with the state DEC, and in fact, we sit in their offices in downtown Albany. Uh, we've had a partnership with them for almost 40 years now. Our mission is, I'll read it, uh, to facilitate the conservation of New York's biodiversity by providing comprehensive information and scientific expertise on rare species and natural communities to resource managers and other conservation partners. And to that end, uh, we do our, one of our bread and butter um, uh, some of our bread and butter work is assessing the status of species and habitats of conservation concern. In other words, what are the species of New York that we should be concerned about? Uh, what are the special habitats or ecological communities that we should be paying attention to, uh, both when considering development um, around the state, also conservation planning, and a lot of other uses. So we track uh, animals, plants, and, and habitats in a database that's consulted by uh, by the state and other partners as, um, uh, as projects come up that they think might have impacts on those species and habitats. <clears throat> so that was one of our, um, that has always been a, a big part of our mission. Uh, and, and we started to realize uh, back in, in the early 2000, well, early 2010s, I guess, uh, pollinators were in decline. And so now we're, I'm getting into the, the, um, the origin and, and uh, um, and raison d'etre for the, did I just say French? Oh my God, did I just try to speak French in a talk? I didn't I never do that. Uh, the, the, uh, the reason for being of this project. Um, pollinators have been um, known to be in decline for, for quite some time, uh, but uh, it really didn't reach the conservation radar until, until more recently. The, the Forgotten Pollinators is a book from 1996, I think, where people started to raise um, alarm about some of our native species being in decline and, and um, from insects to birds to, to bats in some regions. Um, and, uh, and these are uh, in, the, in the boxes here are just examples of scientific papers that, that, have, um, that have come out since the late 2000s uh, and, and, uh, and early 2010s documenting pollinator declines um, around the globe. And we've all heard lately about the insect apocalypse, right? So the New York Times, this is a, an image from the New York Times piece on the insect apocalypse. Um, there's been scientific literature and, and lots of news reporting. Um, and so the pollinator declines that we've, that we've seen are really part of a larger decline uh, in insects globally. Uh, there are plenty of 
examples of where this is not the case and certain insect groups have done better and certain places are doing fine. Uh, but on the whole, the evidence is pretty strong that insects are declining worldwide. And, and the pollinators are, are, are one piece of that, although, albeit um, you could argue a very important piece. So what are the causes of pollinator decline? They're, they're varied, right? And so we can't pin um, the declines of any particular species on a single factor very easily. It's hard to do, partly because it requires a lot of research, uh, partly because the um, when the declines have happened, there's not much left to study. So in some in the cases of some species, you can't find them to be able to research the causes of their declines. But there are a lot of there is a lot of research on pollinator declines, and and these are sort of the key factors that that have been shown to cause declines in pollinators. Number one, I would say probably uh, is still habitat loss, right? That's the cause of the the leading cause of biodiversity loss globally, um, bar none. Um, especially when you build a subdivision and name it after the thing that you destroyed to build it. Uh, pesticides, of course, are another big one, and um, I think we've all heard about neonicotinoids in the in the uh, news recently, the coated seeds that that are pest, that are pesticide um, they're coated with pesticides uh, that are are uh, decimating pollinators. Um, but there are lots of other pesticides and herbicides and fungicides uh, that have been shown to um, to negatively affect insects. On the upper right, I. I I put in interruption of natural disturbance. And um, I, I think that's important because there are communities or um, you know, natural communities like, like pine barrens that um, are historically fire suppressed. So if you know the Albany pine bush, that's one place where they've, they've done a really great job of restoring fire to the um, natural ecosystem. Um, that's a fire dependent ecosystem. Uh, it gets choked with, with uh, oaks and locusts and other um, other kinds of species that that with a, a natural fire regime wouldn't really dominate. When that happens, um, often the the ground cover gets um, gets covered up and um, and there aren't the bare spots that a lot of uh, ground nesting insects might need. So that's just one example of where suppressing the natural disturbance regime um, can have a negative impact on biodiversity. Non-native species on the lower left there. Um, there's a uh, there's there's both plants and animals that have caused pollinator declines. The the animal um, in the on the upper left of that slide is uh, or that group is a uh, Compsolura. It's a fly uh, that was introduced um, to control gypsy moth outbreaks, um, but has lots of other impacts um, and. Uh, and has been shown to, uh, uh, to be affiliated with the declines of other moth groups. Um, and then uh, below that, I have the honeybee and I'll go into uh, the, the honeybee. It's a European non-native species, um, great for, for, um, for beekeeping and producing honey and for pollinating some crops, but also problematic. And I have a whole slide on that in a minute. Invasive plants have a variety of impacts on, on native pollinators that are, are direct uh, direct competition. So I'm, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but I'm tracing direct competition with natives. Um, and then um, they do provide food to flower visitors like pollinators and, um, and that ends up pollinating invasives. And so there's a cycle there where invasives get propagated by, by some natives. Um, but then there are indirect effects too. And those indirect effects go from the decline in native plants um, that flower visitors might depend on, uh, and and an indirect effect of um, less pollination being delivered to those native or less pollen, excuse me, being delivered to those native plants by pollinators that otherwise that visit invasives instead. So it's a little complex cycle, but um, I think uh, the key thing is there is a lot of uh, potential impacts of invasives on on native pollinators. And finally, climate change. Um, there's there's a few examples of this. Uh, it's hard to show that climate change is the the main impact of climate. I should back up a little bit. The main impact of climate change on pollinators is, and and many insects is presumed to be uh, a potential mismatch between host plants and um, and pollinator um, and insect emergence. Uh, that's one that's one potential example. Or excuse me, one potential impact. And it's, it's the one that's most commonly cited. It's hard to show because it requires a lot of research and a lot of long-term research, uh, which doesn't always exist. 
But um, the, the graph shows where um, uh, the activity period, say, of, a, of an insect uh, might be, it has co-evolved with uh, the activity period or the blooming period of a, of a plant. And then over time, if one of those shifts, but not the other because of climate, um, they could be mismatched and insects could emerge too early for their flower resources or, um, or flowers could bloom, you know, uh, plants could bloom too early. And then when the insects emerge, uh, the flowers are done and they don't have the resources they need. So that mismatch is, is, um, is definitely of concern. It's, it's, there's not a ton of cases of it happening yet, but I do believe um, more and more cases like that will come up. All right, that was a long slide. Let's keep going. So that led to all these uh, talk of pollinator declines um, and, uh, and concerns about pollinators uh, led to some thinking in the Division of Fish and Wildlife at the DEC and in our program about um, trying to keep better track of our, our native pollinators. So bumblebees were first on our conservation radar in about 2011. We started having conversations with the, the DEC and, and, um, and others. And in the New York State Pollinator Protection Plan that came out in 2016, which was largely focused on pollinating for agriculture, um, they, they managed to get in that, um, that plan that DEC would start a multi-year evaluation of New York's pollinators, native pollinator species, um, showing the status and distribution. So that study, um, we were funded to design and, um, and implement that study starting in 2016. We gathered together a big group of advisors because we knew we were not experts in these species. That's still true. I'm not an expert in pollinators, um, despite all the talking I'm gonna do this morning. <laughs> and uh, uh, as, as uh, Avalon mentioned, uh, my plate is, you know, is long and thin and full of birds and whales and frogs and other things. So uh, this, I feel like I've learned a lot in this project, but I'm not an expert. So we brought the experts in and we, we brought in faculty from Cornell and, and SUNY Cobleskill and uh, museum scientists and, uh, and state and federal agency biologists and nonprofits. Uh, so we had an advi great advisory committee that helped us design and implement the survey. We started conducting field work in 20, well, 2017, 2018. Uh, we did three solid years of field work, and then it takes a lot of time to, uh, to go from the field to the analyses, including lots of specimens to go through and get identified and databased and labeled and uh, eventually accessioned into museums. And, um, and all that writing happened to the point where we released the report that I have a snapshot of, of the right on the right in um, 2022, uh, June of 2022 is when our report came out. And I'll give you a link to that. Uh, where you can download that report if you're interested at the end. Our first decision, <clears throat> excuse me, our first decision um, that, that faced us was which pollinators do we focus on? Well, there are thousands and thousands of insects that pollinate um, uh, native plants in, in New York state. And we had to choose very carefully, you know, is it gonna be a bee survey? Well, there might've been some in the room who wanted it to be a survey focused just on bees and we understand all the bees of New York State. Well, we decided that we wanted a, a broader uh, uh, approach to include some of the other important uh, insect orders that pollinate. So that includes the, the Hymenoptera, which includes bees and wasps, the Lepidoptera, moths and butterflies, Diptera, the flies, which are really important pollinators in a lot of, uh, a lot of habitats, and beetles, some of the earliest um, flower pollinators. So we wanted groups that were important for pollination that we didn't know much about. So that's the have poorly understood conservation status bullet there. Ones that had potential declines um, documented um, and that weren't too hard. <laughs> so uh, we needed groups that were, that you know, the taxonomy was settled. And so the sweat bees, for example, the taxonomy of those is tough and they're really hard to identify. And we knew with the funding we had and the time we had, we, we just couldn't comprehensively assess groups like that that were really challenging. Aren't too speciose means not too many species in the group. And so sp species that also were appealing to communities or citizen scientists. That was an important part because we had an iNaturalist project where we allowed, uh, we encouraged people to uh, submit photographs and that turned out to be a really important source of information for our study. So what did we choose? We chose a variety of um, bee groups. Um, three examples here are the um, andrenids, that's the mining bees on the upper left. I'm gonna go 
Um, I'm gonna go clockwise here. So mining bees, leaf cutter bees, and bumblebees, plus also the melitid bees and longhorn bees, not shown. Then um, surfid flies, otherwise known as hoverflies or flower flies, that is a family of flies. Um, that are really important pollinators. That's a fly on the upper right, uh, in case you didn't know, it's a bee mimic. And there are a lot of really, um, really interesting um, questions to ask about bee mimicry, but there's a lot of bee mimics out in the world and you can guess why, because they want predators to be afraid of their sting. These flies don't sting, but they look like they do. So that's a, a surfid fly in the upper right and a bee fly, a different family of, of flies on the lower right. They're the coolest. Then we had a couple groups of moths, sphinx moths, um, some of which pollinate as, as adults and some of which don't actually even feed as adults, but we wanted to comprehensively assess, uh, um, assess sphinx moths because there have been declines in those groups. Uh, Shinia, the, the beautiful pink and yellow moth is a, is a uh, primrose, um, sorry, spacing on the primrose flower moth, primrose moth, um, Shinia florida, it's a it's much, smaller than it indicates, but it specializes on eating primrose. Uh, and there's a group of about 10 species in, in, of moss in that, in that genus. Then we have two groups of beetles, the, the hairy flower scarabs, that's on the, um, uh, on the pink flower and second from left on the bottom. Uh, and so group of dung beetles, scarab beetles, um, and then flower longhorns, which is about a, um, 80 to 100 species that occur in New York. And that's a, um, an elderberry longhorn borer on the lower left, one of my favorites. So those are our focal species groups. And, and, um, and why didn't we have anything to do with the honeybee in this project? Well, here I'll get up on a little soapbox. So here we go. Um, starting with col colony collapse disorder, when that started hitting the news in the mid 2000s, um, Save the Bees campaigns went up all over, right? And, um, and you've seen these, and, and I actually saw this exact poster referred to at a conference I was at over the weekend, where somebody was making the case that all these Save the Bees campaigns focused on, a lot of them focused on honeybees. Well, um, honeybees are not native to the, to the US, as many of you probably know, they're European. They were brought in um, for, they were domesticated and brought in for agriculture starting in, in the 17th century. Um, and, that's true of a lot of our, you know, a lot of our farm species. Um, that's true of, you know, many livestock, many crops that were brought in from other countries. Um, but it turns out that, um, and, and that in itself is, is, you know, is fine and sort of part of uh, human evolution, really. But, um, but it turns out that honeybees outcompete native bees in a lot of ecosystems and has spread disease. The evidence is mounting um, it's, it's actually quite strong that honeybees are, are negatively affecting natives. So does that mean we shouldn't keep bees? Does that mean we, you know, we shouldn't eat honey? No, it, it doesn't. It just means we need to be thoughtful about where we site you know, large, um, large uh, industrial beekeeping, um, beekeeping operations. Um, you know, what we do for natives when we also have bees, you know, kept bees, managed bees in our backyards. So, um, so we didn't focus on bees because, as an example, um, Avalon mentioned that I'm involved in the New York State Breeding Bird Atlas. I have my Breeding Bird Atlas mug uh, available on Zazzle.com. Um, but it would be like, you know, if we focused the New York Breeding Bird Atlas on chickens, right? So that's, that's how I think of honeybees. They're like chickens. We get a lot of value out of them. We, we like managing them and taking care of them. Um, and we get a lot of um, products from them, but they're not a suitable focus of conservation. So that um, is starting to spread. That word is starting to spread. Uh, so here's a Scientific American article you can you can look up that came out in 2020 uh, that sort of summed up the the um, the issues around around honeybees. And and my take home is is this: um, honeybees are an important agricultural tool. Backyard beekeeping is great, but honeybees are not a suitable target for conservation activities and they have stolen attention from native pollinators for many years. So as I mentioned, the pollinator protection plans that have come out at the federal level and the state level really largely focused on crop pollination and honeybees when perhaps they should be focused um, more at least on natives. All right, off my soapbox, back to the study. So the goal of the Empire State Native Pollinator Survey was to determine the conservation status of native insect pollinators 
not on farms. And we had a variety of sources of information, the literature, partner data and museum data, community science, I talked about a naturalist and our own field surveys. Um, and all, that all fed into the, the key piece of information we wanted to derive was the distribution and conservation status of pollinators. And I'll tell you what I mean by conservation status a bit more in a minute. We have three data collection approaches, which are complementary to each other. So they, they all add together to this picture. Surveys by, um, by biologists. There's um, uh, two biologists filling bee bowls to go on the roadside. Um, there's bee expert Sam Drogi with a, an insect net. Community science where um, Aaron White is there on the ground showing an insect to some of the, um, the participants at a workshop that she led. So we led workshops all around New York State, about 12 to 15 of them, something like that. And the primary way that, that people contributed to the study was through iNaturalist. So that's uh, taking photos. Um, we could have a whole session on iNaturalist if you're not interested, if you're not familiar with iNaturalist, but you uh, consider yourself a naturalist and like taking pictures and finding out what species are in, um, are in those pictures, iNaturalist is your best friend. We also combed through museum drawers, dusty, corridors of museums um, from the New York State Museum to the Natural History Museum in New York City to the Cornell Insect Collection, um, and then brought together as much data from partners as we could assemble. <clears throat> Our field surveys um, were had three main components. One we, we called the extensive survey, and any science geeks in the, um, in the audience here will, um, will We'll appreciate that it's a spatially balanced randomized sites on protected land stratified by ecoregion and proportional to ecoregion size. That is a short way of saying we distributed surveys all around New York State. We tried to hit all the major ecoregions of New York that are mapped here in beautiful pastel colors. And we focused on protected lands because they were easiest to access and had some of the best habitat. To complement those extensive surveys, we surveyed target habitats. So these were habitats that we thought would have special pollinator faunas and that would not be well represented in that broad statewide extensive survey. So that was alpine habitats, peatlands, late successional or old growth forests where we also had malaise traps put up um, in addition to the bee bowls and netting. Um, we had, uh, sorry, I didn't mention that on the last slide. Let me go back here for a second. At each of these places that we distributed, we went to wetlands and forests and roadsides and meadows and we had a, a transect of bee bowls that collect insects and we collected insects by net. So lethal sampling is an important part of a pollinator survey because many species can't be detected or can't be identified without specimens and looking under a microscope. Um, studies have shown that, that that kind of scientific insect collection does not impact insect populations. But we also, that's also why we had the iNaturalist project in part to help um, for people who did not want to use lethal methods, but wanted to contribute to the survey. So um, in addition to bee bowls and, and netting in these old growth forests, we put up malaise traps, which are like tents that attract insects. Um, and, and that was mainly targeting the, the hoverflies, the surfid flies that are, are known to be affiliated with older forests. Then dunes and, um, and, and uh, uh, yeah, dunes had a, have special pollinator habitats and also pine barrens on the, on the right. Then we had target species surveys and those target species surveys were focused on particular species that, that were, we knew were rare going into the study. Um, that's a golden pine fly, golden aster flower moth, um, an oil bee, uh, they're a really fascinating group of, of bees um, that are really quite rare and really have declined a lot. And you might recognize the bee on the on the lower right. That is the rusty patched bumblebee, which, um, as you as you might know, is uh, is the only um, native bumblebee uh, currently listed under the Endangered Species Act federally. It is a threatened species, and it used to be in many places in New York State, but has not been seen in New York State in uh, going on 25 years now. But we went to some sites where um, they had been detected once and tried to find them again. Spoiler alert, we, we didn't. They, they don't occur in New York to our, um, as far as we can tell. So just to show you a, an idea of the, or give you an idea of the coverage we had, um, this is, I know you might not be able to read the tiny print here, but the, these target habitat surveys are in blue, the extensive broad surveys are in green and what we called incidental surveys, which is kind of everything else, including, you know, I saw a bumblebee as a, a dead bumblebee on the 
trail as I was walking. I picked it up and I, two, I spent two hours surveying pollinators in this one place. Those are in pink. So we, we covered the state really pretty well over the three years. Uh, and when you add in all the iNaturalist observations, um, this is all the, all the insects, all the records that we had, all the specimens we collected and all the photos from iNaturalist. Uh, it, it's you know, a huge swath of New York State. Um, you'll see some, some gaps in places where there isn't a lot of state land. So like the Southern tier of New York, that's true. Um, and so you, this is almost a map of, you know, in some ways a map of the population of New York, um, but it's also, uh, it's spread pretty well across, across the state. So the, um, the, the community science component really contributed a lot um, to the project. Okay, we're getting towards the results here and then um, a little discussion and then, and then we'll have some Q&A. <clears throat> one of the main products of our project was, um, was a page for each species for 450 species um, on, of uh, a series of distribution maps um, just sort of uh, painted the picture of distribution in, in various ways and a phenology chart and comparing records before 2000 and after 2000 uh, just visually, no, no statistical analysis there, just to, sh just to show so that people could get an idea of are there, uh, are there um, species that might be emerging earlier or later than they had uh, historically. So that's the main pro one of the main products of our, of our project and, and those are all available online. There's like I said, 450 of them. So um, make sure you have room on your hard drive if you do download the full report with the appendices. Some highlights from the project included uh, eight bees and eight fly species that um, had not, to our knowledge, been documented in New York State before, so new state records. Um, but on the flip side, 25 of the bees, 35 flies, 22 beetles, and nine moths. And these are just so those focal taxa that have historical records, but not current records. So these are potentially lost species for New York. Uh, is it absolutely true that they're gone? No. Do we know for sure that they had ever had a, popu a real population in New York as opposed to individuals that lost their way? No, but there are some that had multiple records in, in New York State before 2000 and have not been seen since. And so that's pretty good evidence that um, given the, the coverage we had in our survey that uh, they might not be found here any longer. And we generated these conservation status ranks for 450 species. I'm not gonna go into the great uh, amount of detail on what conservation status ranking is. That's again, a whole other uh, long conversation. But the idea is that we had a ton of data from various sources, that's that top row, that, that um, fed into different factors that help us rate the conservation status. Those factors are in three broad categories. The rarity of a species, how common is it? How rare is it? What is its distribution? trends in that species, has the range changed from pre-2000 to post-2000? And there's a lot of questions you have to ask about, well, is it just people weren't looking? Is it you know, different amounts of effort pre-2000? Pre and there's some statistical ways we, we can address that question. And then threats uh, is the other uh, key piece. And that's, that's more of the expert opinion literature review part of the, part of the um, question. And, and those all feed into the conservation status rank or S rank. So the S rank is, a uh, a uh, feature common to all natural heritage programs. I, I show NatureServe here as the, the organization that sets the standards and defines those and provides tools for coming up with these S ranks. If you're familiar with um, IUCN and their, their red list system where they, they, uh, they're the ones who, who came out with the news that monarchs were endangered. That's the IUCN ranking. Um, and that's, that's a, a great ranking system uh, nature serve is complementary to that, uh, and and often they agree, but not always. So, um, the uh, um, S ranks uh, go from key, the key ones go from S one to S two, excuse me, S one to S five, where we have imperiled all the way up to secure, and then there are other um, S H means historical, meaning not documented here previously, but um, uh, or excuse me. Um, distracted by my dog. Uh, SH means uh, historical, meaning um, that they were present in the state up to 2000, but not documented uh, since. Extirpated would mean really good evidence that they've disappeared completely. And then there are combination ranks uh, to reflect uncertainty in those rankings. 
here's the bottom line, and it's it's a sobering finding. Um, depending on how you calculate it, 38 to 60 percent of the focal species of pollinators were at risk of extinction from New York. So um, here we're defining at risk as S1 and S2, so that's critically imperiled or imperiled. Um, and then historical, too, are ones that have just not been found in the state. So you could, will include those as being uh, at risk of extinction because you can't find them at all. And about half were, were not at risk. And then about 14%, we didn't have enough data to, to say. <clears throat> you could calculate that different ways, right? And if you include S3, which is called vulnerable, or that's the definition of S3, uh, which nature sort of often does when they do these kinds of, of broad assessments, um, that's where you get to closer to 60% of species at risk of extinction. Extirpation is the proper sciencey term for, for, uh, for being extinct in a state, in a jurisdiction. You're extirpated from New York. So that doesn't mean they're extinct in the wild completely. You can break that down by, by focal group too. I don't have time to show you a lot of detail here, but um, one example are these melitid bees, really more properly called melitid bees. The oil bees are one genus here, but um, all of those are at risk uh, of extinction, just five species, but all of them are at risk of extinction from New York. And you can see, um, and if you watch the recording, you might be able to dive into this more in more detail if you're interested. You know, we don't have that many sphinx moths out of the total that are that are at risk of extinction. Um, but but then you can look at some of the other groups like the flower flies have, you know, a, a larger percent and bees overall have a larger percent of species at risk. Um, so lots of detail in the in the results that we could dive into, but um, I, at the uh, for the sake of time, we will move on. So here's a few examples uh, I threw together yesterday of uh, notable pollinators of the Hudson Valley. Here are some rare species that, that you might see if you're out in the Hudson Valley. Um, the zebra longhorn beetle uh, is an S1, just a few records for the southern part of the, of the Hudson Valley. Uh, beautiful, striking longhorn beetle. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. The ash sphinx, um, and this photo is from uh, Dylan Sipkowski from the Hawthorne Valley, um, <clears throat> Hawthorne Valley um, Farnscape program, and uh, and I think he's on the call today. So now I'm, I'm embarrassed that I probably mispronounced his name and, and his affiliation. But anyway, uh, the ash sphinx is really rare, right? So it's um it's an ash specialist. What's happening to all our ashes? Well, emerald ash borer has killed a lot of ashes, and so um, uh, this is a species to be concerned about. Even though it can, the larvae can um, uh, feed on other species. Um, primarily it's ash, so that, that's a species of concern. And the, the golden northern bumblebee, which is Bombus fervidus, um, is, uh, is an interesting species because it, um, it started the project as an S1. So we had just very few recent records, but during the last, the course of the project, a lot more records came to light. And it seemed pretty clear that wasn't just survey effort, but that it was, um, but, but that it was uh, probably rebounding from uh, the pathogen that, that seemed to knock its populations way down in the 1990s. And so it ended up the project as an S3, still vulnerable, right? And it's still considered globally, uh, I think it's IUCN ranking is, is endangered. And um, I think it's global rank is only a G3, which means like, you know, vulnerable global, globally too. Um, and there are other states, I was just the conference I was at this weekend where they are still not seeing Bombus fervidus um, so it might have rebounded in New York, and maybe just that rebound is going to take some time to get somewhere else, or maybe we'll see it decline again. It's one to keep an eye out for, and it's a gorgeous bumblebee. All right, so my, if I'm not running out of time yet, 912, okay, I better move on through. Um, management and conservation, I will go quickly through this so we have time for questions. So I talk too much, don't I? Um, Pesticides, that's a key one, of course, we need to reduce our use of pesticides. And, and that's true of neonics and, and other pesticides that we spray all over, all over crops and gardens. Um, we need to rethink mowing, right? So we mow medians, all these lawn medians and um, that, you know, that, that you see as you drive along a highway or uh, you go to our state parks and, you know, and there's grass, lawn grass everywhere. And we could be turning those into pollinator habitats. And, and a lot of organizations are. The parks are thinking about that. DOT is thinking about that. Invasives like the spotted knapweed, knapweed are, um, attract a lot of pollinators, uh, but then um, again, there's, then there's uh, less pollen services being delivered to native plants. And they attract mostly generalist pollinators. 
industrial beekeeping. Should we be should we be having industrial beekeeping um, happening near our natural preserves? Maybe not, because those honeybees are probably competing with natives and maybe spreading disease. And light pollution. I know that doesn't sound like a pollinator issue, but remember that so many of our pollinators are moths. Anything that what the state entomologist told me was anything that you when you smell a flower when you're outside at night, that's a moth pollinated species, right? Makes sense. Otherwise they'll close up. So moths are very subject to light pollution. And so that's that is an issue for pollinators. And what can you do? Right back to um, I always turn people to the Xerces Society because they are the experts on this and they have a lot of great resources at that website. Uh, if you just go to Xerces.org, you'll find it. Uh, they have a, a whole lot of resources for pollinator um, conservation, both at the you know at state and national levels and also for backyard um, backyard purposes. Key thing uh, would be replacing your lawn with as much as possible with a um, you know monoculture lawn. It may rely on herbicides and pesticides um, with you know wildflowers and, and planting natives as much as you can. Uh, Xerces has this great diagram for your whole landscape. Your whole backyard landscape could be um, could be focused around pollinator um, pollinator nesting habitat and foraging habitat. So I know there's not too much detail in there to go into right now. You could lobby if you want to. There's the Birds and Bees Act is in the state senate. Uh, which would ban neonics statewide. And I am not in a position to advocate for or against that, but that's an option for you if you would like. And contributing data to iNaturalist and uh, Bumblebee Watch, which is run by the Xerces Society. Those are really key. I showed, I think, how important those data were for, for our project um, and, and anything you can do to contribute information and, and observations of, of uh, native pollinators is, is always a good thing. Even though our project has finished, um, though that monitoring work and keeping track of rare species lives on. Million people contributed to the study, DEC, our advisory committee, academic labs, state museum, others at New York Natural Heritage Program, iNaturalist identifiers and contributors and partners for um, contributing data. Okay, I think I sped up quickly enough that we still have 15 minutes or so for questions. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, and uh, you feel free to reach out to me if you'd like. And that's the website where you can find our report. Avalon, I'm done. Yes, thank you so <laughs> much, Matt. <laughs> wow, I think we're all just sitting here um, amazed and inspired. I certainly am. Um, and I'm looking through the questions in the chat. I think, yeah, we can proceed to a little bit of Q&A if you wanna de-share your screen. Um, and Joshua can do his Zoom magic so that maybe Matt and I are visible. Um, and yeah, we have some great questions in the chat. We have a few, um, because I'm in charge of the Zoom, I get to ask my questions first, although I will be um, pretty quick and I think they might be helpful. I did wanna just touch Matt on one thing that you mentioned, which was specialist versus generalist pollinators. And I know that that comes up kind of throughout um, so one question that I had was, does the survey, <clears throat> and I think I know the answer, which might be no, but does the survey offer any clues as to why some species are at risk and not others? Could that be related to how some pollinators specialize on certain plants and some are what we call generalists? Could you just give a quick definition of, you know, specialist and generalist? Sure. Um, what specialist pollinators are ones uh, that, um, and there's a with bees, they call it oligolectic if they are, um, if they're specialist pollinators. Oh God, do I have that right? Somebody could correct me. Um, I think it's oligolectic bees are the ones that are um, that are specialist pollinators um, on individual plant species or are, you know, just a few. And then um, I don't remember the other term. <laughs> I told you I wasn't a pollinator expert. Um, and then um, uh, there are many species like bumblebees. Most bumblebees are, are generalists and they will forage on a variety of, of uh, different plant species. And our survey, um, has the information with which someone could do that kind of analysis. And we didn't have the time or funding to do that, but I think it would be really interesting to look at the particular species shown uh, to have declined or, or to be in trouble. Are those primarily specialists or, or, or not? In the case of bumblebees, there are bumblebees that are known to have declined. We're, we're down you know, about four or five species from our historical bumblebees in New York. And, um, and those are generalists, but they got hit with a pathogen and that's what 
not that much. So it wasn't that case about flower resources. Does that answer your question? That totally answers my question. We have some more questions um, sort, sort of similar to that in the chat. Um, one actually has to do, since we're talking about with um, the relationship of bees and their plants, uh, we had a question just clarifying the pollinator decline relationship with invasive plants. So is that just a case of the invasive plants take up the space that the native plants would have been in and so there are less natives to use as food or um, are there some invasives like we talked about spotted knapweed that can just substitute in as a food resource? I think they, they'll, um, they'll substitute in as a food resource for some species and not others. I think that's the key thing that, that um, you know, pollination is a, is a history of coevolution. It's coevolution of plants with native pollinator, with native, um, excuse me, native plants with native insects. Uh, and so um, when you get in the way <laughs> and you have invasive plants that come in and, um, and either evict those native, excuse me, invasive plants that come in and, um, and evict those native plants, well then some species of pollinators will have nothing to forage on. This is an extreme example, obviously. Um, because that's a that's a coevolutionary relationship, um, it, it's it's fragile, right? And so, if any one piece is missing, then the, then the other piece um, might not be able to thrive. Um, so, invasives um, can be great food sources for some native pollinators, but not all. And and the danger is that if we're overrun with invasive plants, then there aren't native plants for some of the more specialist co-evolved uh, native insects. That's the, the primary concern, I would say. Not that, you know, insects forage on a, an invasive plant and get poisoned and die. That's not, that's not what's happening. It's taking up space, like you said, um, and, and displacing the, the native species. Great. Um, thank you. Right. So we had another question about, or a couple of questions kind of about climate change. Um, and that timing mismatch. I know we have a lot of folks that are interested in phenology and the timing of when things bloom. Um, so this question is what cues do pollinators and plants use for emergence? Like, so that might be one we, we wanna check in with a specialist about, but yeah, would those, you know, if, if the spring is just warmer overall, I'm sort of interpreting the question, does that mean everything would just shift forward or why do we sort of expect a mismatch between the pollinators and the plants? Yeah, that's great, um, and I can address it a little bit, but uh, but not but not at the level that an, that an expert could. I think the key places to expect a mismatch are when um, the ground might be warming at a rate that's different from um, the uh, what cues. Uh, okay, start over. Um, <laughs> I think I can address it. Uh, there are ground nesting bees, for instance, two thirds of of um, native bees are solitary, right? And they're, um, a lot of them are ground nesters. And if the ground warms sort of at a, and it changes warming at a different rate from how, um, from snow melt, say, that might be the cue for plants to start coming up, uh, then plants could bloom earlier or later than the bees emerge because they're not cueing in on the same aspects of what's changing in the climate. That's when you might expect a mismatch more than, more than any other time. It's not, uh, and then in other cases, they will keep up, right? And I think there are documented cases of insects keeping up with the host plant, changing host plants. Um, throw on top of that distributional changes that come with climate too, and it gets even more complex. But uh, the mismatch question is mostly about different things warming at different rates and changing warming at different rates. And, and that's when causing that mismatch. Great, okay, that's really interesting. Yeah, and you actually touched on the next question I was going to ask, which also came in the chat, um, which is about that changing distribution that we're starting to see from climate change. So this person asks, with rising temperatures as a result of climate change, is New York changing to zone six instead of five and five B? You know, what, should we anticipate this is going to change our pollinators and the plants that support them? I can't answer the zone question. Uh, I think we've changed zones in my lifetime. I'm pretty sure we have changed zones, but, um, and the short answer is yes, we're going to, they're going to be different, you know, um, garden plants and, and crops that thrive better in, in different climate conditions. Um, and pollinators will either keep up or not, but the pollinator community will change with that aspect of climate change too. 
so so the, the yeah. short answer is yes, 20 years from now, we're, we're likely to see a different, um, you know, different, uh, different backyard plants being able to, to grow and different crops doing better than others and insects changing accordingly. That makes sense. So I'm going to, I'm kind of skipping around in the chat because I'm trying to flow. So we'll see if it works or not. But that is sort of um, a great lead into another question that's been asked by a few folks about there are folks sounding the alarm about deer deer over browse of native plants to the point where forests are not regenerating, spring ephemerals are disappearing, maybe other native plants are disappearing. And I know this is also a concern, deer impacts are a concern for, um, as we try, plants try to migrate northward, but they can't if the deer are just eating them. Um, and so, yeah, has, have you as a wildlife biologist looked into that or, um, Let's see, what's the actual question? Is there any evidence that this deer overpopulation is having an impact on pollinators? Not to my knowledge, but yeah, it is. I mean, yeah, you know, I don't I don't know if there's I don't know if there's scientific papers that show a specific relationship between deer overbrowsing and pollinators. There are definitely um, studies showing effects of deer overbrows on other insects and therefore birds. Um, so I don't know about a link with pollinators, but anything that's that's you know foraging on spring ephemerals in the forest is going to be impacted by deer overbrowse. So I think that should be added to my threat slide. Honestly, I think that's a great point, and I and really it's probably in the Hudson Valley more than anywhere in New York. Probably it's um, that's that should be on the on that key threats to pollinators because I'm sure the loss of those understory plants is is really problematic. Yeah. Totally. So, all right. I have a few questions in the chat about specific species, um, which I know we're gonna we're gonna try and keep it general. But maybe I'll just ask them out loud, and then if we don't have answers, we can find them and send them out with the follow up materials. So, someone asked about carpenter bees. Should I feel bad about killing carpenter bees? Um, that's kind of a new one for me. I'm curious yeah. what you think. Yeah, um, I can't tell you whether to feel bad or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky. I, that is a tough one. I, they're um, they're one of those native species that's a bit of a pest, right? So, um, and they are pollinators. So, if you can find ways to either live with them or discourage them from um, from your house <laughs> and maybe your neighbor's house uh, while providing other habitat for them, I think that's your best bet, right? I don't know how willingly they'll move over to stumps and snags and logs and things that you have, but I mean, I've seen them nest, nest in fest, fence posts. And I just learned recently actually that they're a relative newcomer to the Northeast. They, they're a Southern species that has moved North in the last 20, 30 years. Um, that doesn't make them not native. Um, I think of them as native species. Uh, but they are, you know, it's like the woodpeckers that that you know knock on your drain pipe or your chimney or, and, and make noise and you know and and maybe even nest in your house and uh, they're pesty and if you can find a way um, and and flying squirrels in your attic or bats in your attic and like these are native species that that are just are are reacting to not having their natural places to nest and go to. Um, I also think that. A few holes that for carpenter bees that you plug up are probably not going to have a major population impact, right? They're common species; they're doing fine, um, and I think they're they're also in the wild, but they tend to focus on human settle, you know, human um, development because there's a lot of good nesting habitat for them there. So I'm of two minds. I want to say no, never kill a native species, never get rid of a native species, but that that's also not realistic for a lot of homeowners to be able to do. So. Now you mentioned um, lack of habitat, need for habitat. One thing I noticed wasn't in your slide about what we can do to support native pollinators is bee houses or you know these sort of artificial cute habitats. Um, and I know I've heard some controversy about that and this wasn't in the chat, but I'm just curious if you can give us a yay or a nay. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't, I, sorry. I, um, I meant to look up, I meant to look into that a little bit because I thought it might come up. Um, the, the Xerces slide that I showed of the little kind of like backyard landscape of, of foraging and nesting habitats has a bee house in there. I don't know if you saw that, but um, it's just one example. And I know I, I don't, I'm not up on the latest of what the problematic parts of, of having bee houses might be. Mm -hmm. Providing nesting substrate um, is great. 
And, and I think that's probably even more limiting in some places than foraging, right? So it's not that there's no flowers, it's that there's no place to nest where they won't get disturbed or, or um, you know, or, uh, or trampled or, uh, or stumped on. So um, I do think that it's always better to provide a native sort of like a natural habitat, you know, logs and stumps and things like that. So leaving the dead wood in your backyard, if you have a backyard where you can do that, is, is always a better option, but that's not an option for everybody. And if you have a small backyard or a really urban or, or you know, uh, suburban backyard where all you have is a, you know, patch of grass and a bee house is probably great. I just don't know about disease transmission and things. And I think that's what some of the controversy might have yeah. been about. So I can't speak to that. Um, it's like having a birdhouse, birdhouse is replacing a natural cavity in a tree or, and better to have a natural cavity if you can. But if, when you can't, looking to these alternatives is a good idea. But I would encourage you to read up on what the issues are with, with um, bee houses, because I'm, I'm not familiar. Maybe somebody in the audience is. So, and yeah, I think some folks in the audience have mentioned about the different disease concerns and, and others. So <laughs> we are at 929 and like 25 seconds. So we probably <laughs> want to wrap it up. Um, we can go over a little bit, but I know Joshua has a few remarks he wants to make. I just want to nod to a few of the great questions in the chat that we didn't have a chance to answer. Um, and maybe we can we usually do a good amount of follow-up if anybody's new to morning coffee, you know, we'll send out these links and resources and hopefully maybe we'll be able to answer some of these questions. So folks had great questions about um, how native pollinators sometimes are agricultural pests. What do we do in that case? That's kind of like the carpenter bee question, house pest, agricultural pest. Um, we did have a number of questions about specific plants that we can plant for um, supporting of our native at-risk pollinators. And I'm thrilled to say that that is exactly what our Pollinate Now program is designed to address. So we will shortly, hopefully within the next month, be releasing this great plant list designed by Landscape Interactions um, that matches specific at-risk native pollinators with their populations in decline to the plants that they need to provide pollen, nectar, as well as um, habitat and host plants. Um, we had some good conversation in the chat about buying treated plants. So not just getting rid of pesticides, but also um, not looking for seeds or plants that have been pre-treated with pesticides. That's a great one. Um, and yeah, just some, I'm, I'm seeing questions in the chat and then I'm seeing ways that folks have answered and, and had little conversations. So that's wonderful. We will be exporting the chat and going, if we missed any questions, we'll try to grab them. And maybe Matt, we can quickly follow up with you or you can give us some um, some other resources to go to. Um, I want to thank you so much. This was so fun. Um, I know environmental presentations feels like there's a lot of gloom and doom to go around these days, but I feel like there's a lot that we can do for these native pollinators. And it starts with the really deep level of understanding that you've given us. Um, so thank you so much for that. And I want to toss it back to Joshua before we go for the day um, and just give him the, the last word here. So thank you all. Thank you, Avalon, and thank you so much, Matt, for your presentation, and thanks to everyone who joined today. I hope that folks will consider joining us for our next morning coffee session. Stay tuned for the announcement on that. If you're not already on our mailing list, and I assume most of you are since you are here, please, if, please go ahead and sign up on our website at climateactionhb.org. Uh, as Avalon mentioned, keep an eye out for follow-up from me in terms of resources and the recording of this session and any questions that Matt may not have had a chance to answer. We also have a few opportunities coming up to get your hands dirty by supporting local ecological restoration projects that we at PCA are supporting. So in Hudson, Kite's Nest is offering volunteer opportunities on their ecological restoration project on four different Wednesdays uh, in the evening from 5 p.m. to sunset, uh, including tomorrow. April 26th, there will be a couple in May as well on the 10th and 31st, and also two Sundays, April 30th and June 11th. In Poughkeepsie, we also have the Preserve at Vassar that needs help with the riparian restoration project and removing invasive species on May 5th and May 19th from two to four. So if I know that a lot of dates and times, if you wanna reach out to me directly, happy to connect you with folks. Um, you can also check out some of these 
volunteer opportunities on our Instagram, which is Climate Action HV. We try to post events there and also um, on our website and on the Hudson Valley Climate Action Network uh, calendar as well. So thanks again, everyone. Um, have a great day. Thanks.